Now then, you're very welcome along. So after the endless uh, build-up and talk and the squad selection and just the general anticipation that comes with a World Cup, it's always quite surreal when it's suddenly here. And it is suddenly here. Republic of Ireland against Australia in Sydney, 11am. Irish time tomorrow morning is one of those very historical moments. If you love your sport, there will be... Uh, motion in the air I think especially at anthem time the country at large will savour it and then the whistle will blow and suddenly there are the nuts and bolts of a football game to contend with so it is all upon us in a big way Kathleen McNamee is one of the many in Sydney hello hello how are you Joe I'm great and Sinead O'Carroll of the Journal also in Sydney hello hi how are you great how is the respective jet like Um, I somehow have swerved it feeling okay I landed in Sydney in the evening which I think is key to not getting hammered but um yeah or maybe I'm just really excited and running on adrenaline I don't know <laughs> <laughs> I'm jealous of you today because I'm here like a week and a bit like probably a week and a half at this stage and I'm still waking up at 3 a.m and I'm like buzzing with the energy between three and seven and like chatting to everyone at home being like oh what's happening and then I absolutely crash for about two hours and then I'm buzzing again and then I crash again at about five o'clock. So I just really haven't got adjusted to it at all, which is probably going to be worse by the time we go to Perth and then there's another time difference. But uh, yeah. I think you said... Kathleen, put yes. your phone away between three yes. and seven. Don't like wake up. Don't get on your phone. Yeah, Kathleen, Come I'll on. be honest. That sounds like you're manic, not jet lagged. <laughs> that could also be true. I think a lot of my family and friends would say similar things in fairness. <laughs> So uh, the players touched down in Sydney. I just have a clip here because the video, uh, you know, went reasonably viral. I don't know what qualifies as viral these days, but they got an amazing welcome at the airport. So naturally enough, Katie McCabe and Vera Power asked about that in the press conference. Have a listen. It was such a special moment, I guess, because we've we've seen a lot and heard a lot. Um, obviously, we felt a lot when we were back in Dublin um, in our pre-camp. Um, but to kind of see it in person when we arrived um, was a really special feeling. And for us, um, yeah, it's it's amazing. And it was nice to kind of have that moment with our fans briefly in the airport. But um, yeah, of course, now it's it's full focus on on preparing for the for the game tomorrow. And I'm hoping that um, yeah, the fans come out in, in numbers. Tomorrow night and, and cheer us on. Uh, we, we knew that there would be fans, um, but it's so heartwarming every time again the way the Irish are reacting on us. It's not just being there, it's the way that they are there. And um, that gives us such a boost, and it's just so nice. Uh, and we embraced it again. It, it, we just took a little bit of time. I'm not sure if everybody was happy with that, but um, it's so nice to have our fans around us. So I don't know what your sense is, Kathleen, but at various uh, junctures in this World Cup journey, be it the immediate controversy after qualification and the singing in the dressing room or the allegations over Vera Pau, which again surfaced this week, or even the, the farewell game against France, which obviously was a loss uh, to the Colombian game and is Denise O'Sullivan fit or not fit? That airport footage was almost like a nice reminder for the players. This is going to be a lot of fun as well. People are going to feel good here. That you know, we can we can enjoy this. And I, I I suspect for the players that was a nice moment. Yeah, definitely. I've been calling out for this level of fun for so long around this team. As you said, there has been all these different controversies, and even when the squad was announced, like I remember going out to UCD to chat to Vera Powell about it. And it was like someone had died and she said it was like the worst day of her life. And I was like, everyone was asking all these morbid sort of questions. And I was like, can we all just take a step back for two seconds and appreciate like how brilliant the squad of players are and how much they deserve their moment. And um, I think the last couple of weeks have been an absolute whirlwind for the team. And there's been so many good times in that as well as the bad times. You know, you look at, say, the event off the ball did at the Mansion House to send them off. That was probably the first time for me since the squad was announced that it actually felt like a proper celebration. And then you definitely had that again today with the players arriving into the airport in Sydney. And it was also really nice because a lot of them hadn't seen their family in a couple of weeks and they were all there too. You know, some players like Katie and Louise had managed to see some of their family when they were in Brisbane because they had just opted to travel a little bit earlier than everyone else. But uh, I think today in the airport would have been a nice reminder for the team, but also a little bit of the pressure. You could see some of the players were really enjoying it and signing things and shaking hands. And then there were other players who were like steely focused, look straight ahead. Don't get too invested in it because there's, as you said, there's a game to play tomorrow. 
Yeah, I don't know. Um, certainly here, Sinead, I'm not sure when you travelled out, but um, even just driving into work today, maybe because we're on the eve of the tournament, it did suddenly strike me that whether it's Dublin City Council or whoever, like there was no bunting anywhere really in the city. You know, even driving down the Keys, they had the flags up from the four counties who played in Crow Park at the weekend. And I was thinking, geez, I wonder, should we have we missed a bit of a trick here in terms of just the tricolour all over the city? Maybe that's going to come. I don't know. Has it gone up a notch in, in Sydney? Is there a real sense of the World Cup is on? I mean, it, it must have certainly from an Australian point of view, I would think. Yeah, we've definitely missed a trick at home and I'm I'm super frustrated at corporate Ireland because that's unfortunately who we kind of need to get on board. Like Sky and Capri have done a lot for this team, but, you know, there's no displays in any of the sports shops. You know, they, they didn't, you know, make enough of the, the women's jerseys to sell. There's not a huge amount happening in supermarkets. You know, Dunn stores had some uh, merchandise. They sold out really early of it. Like, you know, their rugby gear is already in, you know, now. So I think, yeah, it's, it's really unfortunate because like what, else do women's sports uh, people and organizations have to do to prove that people will come and, and, and buy stuff you know I know our office in the journal were looking for bunting earlier so that they could decorate the office tomorrow for a bit of a watch party and they couldn't find it anywhere so you know I think it is really unfortunate but hopefully lessons will be learned and, and next time uh, it'll be a bit different but uh, yeah in Australia I was talking to a couple of journalists today and they said it was a bit of a slow burn here as well uh, the multi-city element definitely plays into that it's not just like everyone landing into one airport or everybody you know coming to the one city so um, but it has definitely picked up um, like I came out of a train station yesterday and looked up and there was this really cool picture of Mary Fowler like painted onto the side of a massive glass skyscraper um, you know so there's because it reminders everywhere of the Matildas reminders everywhere of uh, the World Cup being here and then I went out to the stadium yesterday to have a look and that was when like the moment really hit me that like oh my god Ireland are playing in a World Cup in this vast stadium out in the Olympic Park mm. um, and the more work was being done yesterday and today to kind of get it match ready and it's you know in a colourful park um, there'll be you know lots ample space for fans to kind of stick around uh, beforehand and mingle and uh, I think yeah it will it will have really really good vibes tomorrow the um, Australian coach Tony Gustafsson Swedish he was disconcertingly confident I felt so he was saying things in his press conference like yeah I know my starting 11 I know what substitution is going to make I know what my finishing 11 will be and then he went on and he said if you look at Ireland's games lately against top teams there is no coincidence that they've been really really strong at the beginning of both the first and second halves but also it's no coincidence that they have conceded goals late in each half, especially when it comes to tactics and behaviours of one or two players that we have identified. We hope to strike against those tomorrow. I'm not going to say what, but there's a clear trend and we'll target that. And bloody hell, it's like Brennan Rogers writing names in envelopes and saying some of you are going to let me down. <laughs> um, na name and shame, Tony. So uh, look, they're pretty confident, I think it's safe to say, Kathleen. What do you suspect he's talking yeah. about? Uh, well, just before I go on to that, it's interesting you say that because I was talking to a lot of the Australian journalists as he was speaking and they were messaging me panicking about how confident both him and Sam Kerr were in their press conference. Like Sam Kerr said something about, you know, tomorrow is all about us. It's not about anyone else. Like Ireland, they don't even factor into us. We respect them, but it's all about us tomorrow and we know what we're going to do. And all the Australian journalists were messaging me being like, oh no, we're playing into Ireland's hands. Like they see themselves as the underdogs. They think they're going to go into this game and be able to take us on and they're right to think that. So I thought it was quite interesting the on the ground response compared to what they were actually saying. And another thing that a couple of people were pointing out was like Australia's form in the Asian Cup that they played. A couple of the journalists were saying to me like Tony Gustafsson probably should have been fired at that stage, but they kept him on and he kind of has brought them back around again, but they still have a little bit of, to prove. So as much as they're coming out as confident and as much I do think they probably are the better team, mm. there is still a little bit of uncertainty on the ground about how confident they should be. In terms of what he's talking about, I mean, I didn't really read that much into when he was saying about, you know, we've studied Ireland's game and they start strong and they let goals in like at the end of the half and then they kind of scramble because I think all of us know that like 
it's been a flaw in our game for so long. You look at that France game, how well we played in that first half. And then that one goal went in and it was such a terrible goal to give away. And all of a sudden we kind of fell apart a little bit and then we managed to regain it in the second half, but then also let it slide again. And that is a constant pattern that we've been trying to get rid of for so long. So I don't see that as like a major tactical insight from him so much as just something that someone who's watched about two Ireland games could probably pick out. Well, maybe it's funny when he talked about certain areas and certain players who maybe switch off a touch. I went from watching his press conference, reading his comments to then listening to the Koi Gig podcast. And it was Emma Byrne who made the point that down both Irish flanks, we have like attack minded players in defensive positions and they they see opportunity first as opposed to being typically brilliant pessimistic defenders who see I should drop back in case something goes awry there. And Emma Byrne was saying, if you're going at Ireland, you're trying to take advantage of those attack-minded players in defensive positions. So I took two and two there, Sinead, and I thought that's maybe what our friend Tony was talking about. Maybe it was all bluster, I don't know. Yeah, I kind of agree with both of you. I think a lot of that came directly from the France game. I think he probably watched the France game a lot because they were about to play France and he was probably looking at Heather Payne and um, when Katie McCabe went off. So I think he was thinking, you know, Ellie Carpenter can neutralize Katie McCabe and therefore we'll have opportunities there. And then Heather Payne uh, on the other on the other side, you know, is she a weakness there? Can we can we get through her? Can we get around her? So for me, I think I think there's b- both of your theories kind of match up in, in a way. Um, I was c- kind of surprised that he was as candid as that because there was kind of no need to be, and particularly around that idea of like behaviours of certain players. Yeah. And I think that's probably where the journalists, Australian journalists, were texting you, Kathleen, because it, it was just an unusual thing to say. It reminded me a little bit of how much praise the Limerick managers get in hurling for being really good in-game coaches. It was like he was almost looking for praise for having an in-game plan ahead of the game. It was, it was kind of a misunderstanding of why people get praised for that. It's like it's an in-game plan. It's yeah. not like a pre- It's actually a very good way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think part of it was probably that because he is criticised quite a lot, mm. um, that that might have been where it was coming from because he wasn't asked a question. Like the question he was answering was, who's your starting 11? And it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek question from, from an Aussie journalist. So... Um, he kind of, you know, uh, started his own soliloquy after that question, which was yeah. a strange choice, I thought. Yes, you're right. There, There is a degree of, here's what a mastermind I am <laughs> about it. I was just uh, looking, and I, apologies, I don't mean to quote Bucky's odds um, too liberally, but I, I was just trying to get a sense of where... Uh, we are. Ireland are 10 to 1 outsiders for this game. Australia are 4 to 1 on. So that, I think, Kathleen, maybe for people coming late to the party, will give a, a realistic sense of expectation. Ireland are up against it for various reasons here. What are the selection dilemmas, if any, for Vera Pau? What position on the pitch or two are you going to be looking at first tomorrow when the team is named? Uh, I would be very, very surprised if Vera changes her team from the France starting squad. Like there, are, I in, like in my head, there are players for contention. I think you could argue for say Rusha, Little John, or Lily Ag. I think you could also argue for Kira Caruso or Amber Barrett up front. But I think the way that Vera likes to play means that those changes probably won't happen tomorrow, and she will see them more as impact substitutes that can come on. Um, I think if say a player like Ethan Mannion was fit and in the squad it would also be a different setup again I know we talk about it on the Koi pod quite a lot like Karen and Emma are very against the idea of Megan Connolly playing in a defensive position and think she's better in the midfield I remember from talking to Megan about it in Marbella at that training camp they had where they played China and kind of asking her you know how do you feel about playing a defensive position and you know when someone is trying to spin a positive on it and say I want, I'll do whatever I want for the team like I'm there for the team I know she does prefer not playing there as much so that there's possibly an argument well then should a Diane Caldwell start there but she again is probably better coming on as an impact player so my head says that Vera won't change anything for tomorrow but if I was to look at a position and there was to be a change I think it would either be that starting striker or else somewhere in midfield yeah, what's jumping out to you, Sinead? Yeah, I would be the same. I think uh, Rita and Lily Agar, for me, the 
the kind of either or that I thought would actually be different ahead of France. I, I actually did think that I had kind of um, jumped over Risha in Vera's head. So like some of what we do here is we try and predict our own team, like what we'd like out there. And then we try and predict Vera's team um, and they're wildly different. Um, Are yours a touch more the, attacking? Um, in some ways, yeah. Like I, I again would like to see Megan Connolly not playing a defensive role but I think because Aoife Mannion and it's so funny Aoife Mannion's only played like what two games like we feel like we miss her because okay. she just gives more options because if she's there then there's just you know more options for other people to be elsewhere and mm. um, same goes for Megan Campbell so I think that the fact that the two of them have actually changed the perception of our depth a lot it's it's two players who might not necessarily have even all, always started every game but I think it, it does change what options are available to us um, in terms the Vera predictions like she is just so even again like someone who hasn't played a lot of it has doesn't have a lot of cops over Ireland but she's so keen on Marissa Shiva playing in that pocket role and just being that engine and I do think we saw like a lot of good stuff from her against France in that like she was able like she was doing some uh, runs and getting to balls that even was surprising some of her Irish her Irish teammates mm. um, like so there was a couple of balls that she got to that I could tell people were kind of leaving as if they were going to go out or they were going to go straight to the France defenders and she ended up getting them so and then she was still running like at a very very high like energy at the very very end of, of that game so Vera's really taken with that and um, in some ways that's great but she doesn't have the natural ball skills and abilities on the ball as, as some of the others who are on the bench. So you're kind of giving one on one hand and taking yeah. away with the other. So that's probably another one for me that we could probably play a bit more ball if she wasn't playing. But I understand why she's there. Yes. Um, and that's the tricky to me, isn't it, Kathleen? Like Emma Byrne was even saying her dad routinely rings her angry that Ireland don't keep the ball better. Yeah, it is a problem that we have in that, I think, we have always been a team that's very comfortable with balls being thrown at us and like lobbing them out. And what we saw in that US game, and like Sinead was saying, we talk about missing a player like Aoife Mannion, even though she doesn't have a couple of caps. Oh, she only has a couple of caps. But the reason we miss her is because in that US game, we went toe to toe at world champions. And we actually did it over a pretty sustained period compared to the France game. And that's because we had players like Aoife Mannion who could keep the ball. Like I remember one of her first touches for Ireland was against China in that game in Marbella. And she had the ball on the very corner of the goal. Like Courtney Brosnan didn't want to go to it because it had been a pass back. And she just like turned the ball so beautifully around the Chinese player, dodged past like two or three players, still the ball at her feet and managed to like run it halfway up the pitch. And we were all just looking at each other in the press box being like, this is yeah. not something we've ever seen from an Irish player. Like, Katie or Denise, yeah, but yeah. not a defensive player I, like that. I, I think everybody went tick. Mm. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, and But that's the thing, like, with players like Marissa, she would suit that system so well, but Vera C is still committed to that system, even though we don't really have the players at that back positions that can play it out in the same way and who can supply the ball and keep the ball in the same way so that's why you'll probably have Emma Byrne's dad calling her up tomorrow we might even get like a little voice note on Koi Gig when we record our episode after the show <laughs> <laughs> just to hear I, what his real thoughts are <laughs> I think she's expecting a lot from Sinead Farley and Sinead Farley does have that potential I think Sinead Farley's was she said afterwards she was very anxious going into the France game and I think that showed um, I thought that she was uh, a real 50-50 kind of player in the France game there was so much of her potential that was really obvious and there was a lot of things that Ireland did well she was at the centre of and I thought that there was also um, a huge amount of leadership that she showed especially when Heather Payne was under so much pressure she, you could tell that she was helping her through that um, even the way she was talking on the pitch um, <laughs> Yeah I mean if, if Farley's such an interesting case Kathleen because again with her performance akin to Mannion it seemed on the basis of one performance Vera Pau made up her mind I, like 
I, I think she had cramp at the end of the French game. Like I, I did kind of look mm-hmm. at her and think she looked a bit tired. She just hasn't had much football for well documented reasons. That'd be a slight concern because Australia and we might kind of move on to them a touch. They are fast. They are fit. They are strong. I watched a bit of the game against France. I mean, they're a very athletic team. So that'd be a slight question mark over Sinead Farley. Certain from a, certainly from a ninety minutes point of view. Yeah, I don't think anyone sees her as a 90-minute sort of player at the moment. She just hasn't built up the sort of minutes in the match stamina. And especially, as Sinead was saying, you know, if she's doing that role where she's trying to support a player like Heather Payne, and if that who is Gustavuson was establishing as someone that they can target, then there is going to be a higher workload, and especially in a game like tomorrow, because like Australia are so pacey, as you say, and they have so many great attacking players. I think with Farrelly, the thing that she brings is that in-game smartness and the tactical awareness and the spatial awareness, which again is not something that a lot of this Irish team have for one reason or another. Mm. And I think that's where she's really going to benefit us in terms of finding those spaces playing balls into those important spaces and giving us those little glimpses where we might be able to take an opportunity or two and actually bring the game to Australia. I don't think we're going to be able to do, like, say, what we did in the first 43 minutes or whatever it was against France for even half as much time against Australia tomorrow because of how good this Australian team are. So those little moments are going to be really, really important. Yes, I think that's very true. You won't be able to do your piece on Sinead Farrelly Justice Sinead in one answer because it was extraordinary. And when you read the life that she's lived, I think you know you just, you just couldn't but be moved by uh, what she's gone through and where she is tomorrow uh, afternoon in Sydney. But give us a sense of why uh, she's such an admirable person. Yeah, I think if you look at her career tra- trajectory, it started when she was a really young girl, like she was nine when the 99 team won the World Cup. And from that kind of time on, she just always presumed she would be a footballer at an elite level. Um, like, And at that stage, it was looking like there would be professional female leagues in America by the time that she was coming to that point. And and everything was working out for her. She played under 15 uh, in the USA teams. She played right the way up, you know, sports scholarship uh, to the University of Virginia, you know, went straight into the college team um, as a freshman, was really important to to the team um, and got called up to the under 23 national team. So everything was kind of ticking along as it should for someone who was that talented um, and when it came to the draft then she was picked second to only Alex Morgan Alex Morgan one of the most famous uh, people women, female footballers on the planet so you know this is the kind of calibre where she was coming from um, and then she uh, went professional uh, joined um, Philadelphia Independence and met up with coach Paul Riley um, Paul Riley was then one of the coaches who was named in last year's review as being someone who um, was accused of sexually coercing um, his players um, and sexually harassing them. He denies those allegations, um, but Sinead Farrelly, you know, told the the review everything that had happened to her, which included um, her telling of, of sexual coercion at a very extreme level um, to the point that she was depressed, despondent, and just physically not able to play football anymore. There was a car accident as well that um, really impacted her body. So she ended up quitting the sport age 27 and couldn't even bear to look at football anymore. Um, So all of that potential, all of her ability was completely wasted. Um, And there were so many casualties in that career. In 2011, she was invited to play with the US national team. um, And she said no because as Paul Riley had put so much pressure on her to not leave and um, that she felt that if she did, she'd be betraying him and her teammates. And this is the kind of control that he had over her at that point in her life. Um, so she said no to the US women's national team in 2011 mm. and has never been to a World Cup. Um, didn't succeed in any of the ways that she expected to succeed in, in sport. Um 
And it was only after the Me Too movement um, and I think women started sharing their stories that she learned in a language for what had happened to her, that she kind of realized, oh, hang on, this wasn't OK. Um, this wasn't right. This is not what a coach should have done. This isn't this wasn't my fault, basically, and had that realization and then talked it through with people who she trusted. Um, and herself and her teammate, who was also also um, harassed by by the coach, decided to do something about it. So they were the original whistleblowers that kind of blew open um, and revealed all of the really bad stuff that was happening in in U.S. women's soccer. So she went from being someone who couldn't, uh, you know, bear to watch football to being this really important whistleblower in uh, in a league that really needed to be made safer for the women playing in it. Um, mm. And then once she was healing, kind of said, I have to go back. I have to go back and, and try. I have to play again and see if I can make it. Um, she has an Irish father. She lived a little for a little bit when she was younger in Dublin, um, w- grew up in a very Irish American town in Pennsylvania. So has always been a citizen, didn't have to do anything to, to get the passport. Um, and her college coach, who I talked to for that piece, um, had said to her in 2011, you've got to go to the World Cup. He could not understand why she wasn't going to the World Cup in 2011. And so this time he was instrumental in making sure that Vera knew about Sinead, Vera had video of Sinead, um, and that he was kind of that positive influence on Sinead to think that she could do it. Mm. You know, she could get a uh, NWSL team. She could she could get on the national squad for Ireland and she could make it to a World Cup. So um, he was like just singing her praises and her abilities Everyone who has ever played with her um, and the few people I spoke to about it just talked to her about her abilities as like such a natural but not showy footballer. Mm. Um, and so that's the eye I was using when I was watching her against France, just to see that non-showy stuff that she was doing um, that actually was really important. So I think there was a lot of stuff in those four, 43 minutes that Kathleen was talking about that even though there was a good few wayward passes that we kind of all remember, um, there was also a lot of time on the ball that she had. Like she, she had a lot of touches. She had a lot of stuff that that also went right, but it was just a little less showy. Yes. Um, and yeah, that's what her coach has said that she is always the best player on the pitch, but never acts like that. Mm. So it's kind of like the the antidote to the really like. I also love how Katie McCabe is like cocky and showy. Like that's also brilliant, but she's kind of the antidote to that. So, um, yeah, it's a fabulous story. The Americans are going to be watching her. The Americans love her story. They love that she, you know, had that powerful voice during that period of U.S. soccer, but also that she has this comeback with Ireland. So, yeah, it's kind of a side story uh, tomorrow, but I think it will get a lot of attention from from the Americans as well. Yeah, incredible. Well, hopefully the stage is set. And if she wants to do something showy and score a 90th minute winner, <laughs> no complaints. <laughs> just um, just to broaden the discussion out for a brief moment, and we'll get your, your predictions before we let you go. For um, those of us coming to this a touch late or looking for a crash course, this is the ninth edition of the Women's World Cup. First one in 91. We're at 32 teams. Biggest tournament to date. Eight countries, including Ireland, of course, are making their debuts. FIFA are targeting a global audience of two billion and there'll be half a million through the turnstiles USA very much arrive as favourites England are European champions they are in pursuit although they are missing several big names including Beth Mead Spain Germany strong Australia France are in that elite cohort as well and if you chart the winners we start off with the US in China in 91 Norway beat Germany in 95 you mentioned it Sinead very famously in 99 like a moment of real arrival for the game in the States in particular 90,000 at the Rose Bowl Brandy Chastain her celebration is iconic 03 and 07 Germany did two in a row 2011 Japan shocked the world and then uh, USA beat Japan revenge Carly Lloyd Hattrick including a very famous goal brilliant goal in the final in 2015 2019, USA won in France, beat the Netherlands, who were European champions. And now, Kathleen, USA are going for three in a row for the first time. So that that is a brief synopsis of how we pitch up to this tournament. Yeah, I, uh, that's a very good synopsis, to be fair. I was laughing with someone earlier today, the fact that I forget that there are actually other teams in this World Cup other than Ireland. In my head, it's just a four-team World Cup and whatever we do, is that's the trophy at the end of it. Yeah. Um, I think, like, 
I covered the Euros last summer and would have followed a lot of the European teams around the place. And I think Germany in particular is a team that people are maybe sleeping on a little bit, um, especially now the pop is back and properly fit. I think they could really go on a run in this championship, but also you can never rule out the US. That is a really annoying thing. I don't know if you saw the ads that they put out just before the World Cup where it was basically like it's us against the rest of the world. And they had... Very, very stereotypical verging on offensive at times, uh, portrayals of various different countries trying to beat them through various different ways. And at the end of it, they were like, we still come out on top. And no matter what you think about the US, no matter what you think about Andermoski and how much he has like, overplayed his older players and not play his younger players in the right positions, they come into this World Cup with the sort of attitude that we are going to win this and we are going to do this. So you yeah. can never see them down. I think I think for France, it's coming a little bit too early, but I think they'll probably win the next Euros if they can get the team properly together. Um, but yeah, my and I think England as well are just not in the same place that they were in last summer. So I would lean towards the US purely for their mentality and the fact that obviously they have a very talented team as well Yeah. Uh, but I think Germany could be a surprise package for a lot of people Okay England are without Beth Mead Golden Boot winner at the Euros their captain Leah Williamson and Frank Kirby as well and and I guess a hallmark of their Euros campaign was a very consistent side they knew who they were and there was very little changing you weren't joking about the US uh, leaning towards experience by the way so of their squad just seven are 25 years of age or younger and then 10 are over 30 so like there's a degree of you know akin to Dublin we're going for the big one here and we're bringing um, the old guys back there's kind of that vibe with the US yeah and it's like it's Megan Rapinoe's last tournament you know she announced just before the World Cup started that she's retiring uh, and they're doing it even without players like Kristen Press Tobin Heath you know incredible names that could still be playing in these sort of tournaments and just aren't I think I think there's a lot more talent in the younger Americans than there is in the older ones at the moment. And I would have loved to have seen them get more of an opportunity, even in the build up to kind mm-hmm. of prove themselves. But Adonofsky has always been very, very strict on his starting team. It seems to be a common thread, actually, to help <laughs> women's football teams that once a manager decides they like a squad, they don't Change. differ too yeah. much from it. Um so yeah, I would have liked to have seen some of the younger players brought in because there's some insane talent in the NWSL and in the collegiate system over there. I mean, it's why we get players like Heather Payne and Denise O'Sullivan and all the other Irish players that have come out of it with such adept yes. and skill. Um, but yeah, they, I just, I would never rule them out. They just love to come in as being told that they're the underdogs when they know in their heads that they're the big dogs. Yeah, I they did. will be expecting a lot from one of their young stars, Sophia Smith. Yeah, um, but twenty two, yeah, she's they, been name checked by everyone. I think part of the the reason that you would you, they wouldn't be up there in the in the real favourites bracket, I think, is because they are that much older. Um, and I'm saying older rather than experienced because like the the England thing last year really proved that everything has to go right for you to win a tournament like the, the fact that like England had no injuries like everything just went as they wanted it to. they executed the plan like perfectly and that's really hard to do in a tournament um, so if you're going in expecting all of these experienced players to be able to get from like group game one all the way through to a final mm. that's, that's a really tough feat and if you haven't got that balance right between experience and uh, youthful energy and exuberance um, and being able to bring people on and off the bench I think like because that's what worked for England last year was like their their bench was fantastic and that's probably why we're ruling, we're ruling them out this year because they don't have that depth anymore they don't have those leaders because they have a couple of retirements since then as well that um, yeah it's 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 not going to be the same they're not going to be able to do the same thing with, with their bench so mm. yeah I w- that's where I would kind of think America are um, I'd rule them out a little bit more probably than you would Kathy okay <laughs> interesting shout out to Trinity Rodman as well daughter of Dennis scored two goals in the recent warm up game so that's kind of uh, another bit yeah. of intrigue there and good pals with Marisa Shiva are uh our player okay yeah Robin's a really interesting one I interviewed her I was the first person to interview her after she was drafted into the NWSL one of the the youngest okay. ever player at the time to it's be drafted a, I'd in. say she loves questions about her dad does she 
Yeah, not a favorite topic. They didn't have a great relationship, especially right. at the time. Um, I think it has healed a lot, actually, in the intervening years or two since she got drafted in. But at the time in particular, she was very, very strong on her mom being her absolute support and her rock and her brother as well. They are very, very tight as a family. But I've I've seen her dad turn up at a few games and they seem to have talked about their relationship a little bit more but definitely one that has played out behind the scenes Mm. more than in front and she more even than just what she's doing on the pitch I think she's always been very clear that she wants to shoot her own star and not be associated too much with his even though she respects everything that he achieved yeah no nobody wants to be Dennis Rodman's daughter as opposed to a USA World Cup player in her own right just um, hazard to say she's our, she's going to be more famous than him by the time she alright so that, that'll be very famous I mean is she going to bring peace to North Korea she does, she does. Um, just um, to touch on a, a point you made because it's quite interesting you know I mentioned 32 team World Cup and 2 billion watching worldwide half a million through the turnstiles certainly the biggest World Cup a Women's World Cup in history, it is quite uh, notable over the last week or two weeks. It does bring to a head, on the one hand, the game is growing at an unprecedented rate. And on the other hand, it may not be equipped to handle the pace of change. So just to give a non-exhaustive list here of like the, the controversies bubbling away, the Vera Pau uh, situation has been well documented. We're very aware of that. But elsewhere, England are in the midst of a performance-related payment dispute. The Australians absolutely came out very strongly last week. They want parity of payment. They released a video to that effect. At the more serious end, the Zambian coach has been accused of sexual misconduct and one player, current player, told The Guardian... If he wants to sleep with someone, you have to say yes. It's normal that the coach sleeps with the players in our team. Now, the Zambian FA have kicked that to FIFA and FIFA aren't saying very much. So that's a a kind of unbelievable story, which is just floating along into the World Cup. The Jamaican team have penned a letter about the lack of support from their FA in terms of logistics and accommodation and all uh, anything you name it. Canada have threatened strike action over pay equity and budget cuts. In Spain, last year, 15 players declared themselves unavailable over problems with the team environment. They were citing a toll on their mental health, amongst other things. 12 of those remain in exile. So 12 Spanish players unavailable, including three Champions League winners with Barcelona. And across the board, there is an ACL injury epidemic. And I know Vera Pau is very passionate about that. And so there's a real sense like we got to get on top of this in the game. And that's not to mention a FIFA dispute with European broadcasters, which has been settled. But like all told, Sinead, that's a hell of a list. There's, there's a lot going on in the game for all the progress, which is happening at a rapid rate. Yeah, because I think the expectations now of the people who are playing are is are correctly that things need to be better for them, that they can't just settle for um, coaches who were there for the wrong reasons or settle for excuses from their uh, organizing in federations that they are, they can be treated differently to other teams that uh, are organized by the same federations. So. Um, some of it comes from people from people who are playing, finding their voice and finding, like realizing that actually it's not just okay anymore to take the scraps. Um, and I think part of it is that FIFA are kind of quite passive about it all, like kind of just like, oh, that's up to the federations to to figure out, rather than like even in their um, organization of the the payments for uh, every like all players now we're told that they're going to get at least twenty eight thousand um dollars but this week it emerged that fifa have just said oh we're giving it to the associations and they have to figure it out which means that not every player who's playing in the in the world cup are going to is going to get that money that's just not how federations operate across the world mm-hmm. many of them will um but fifa haven't also given any help to the organizations and how to administer it. So like, who's going to pay the tax? What tax is owed on it? Who, like, how do we organize it? Like, so it's it's a very passive way of doing things. Um, and also even things like the broadcasting rights, you know, having this public fight with broadcasters saying like, well, you have to, you know, pay up, you have to value the women. Like, But FIFA aren't valuing the women in the same way they value the men. So mm-hmm. how can they ask that with a straight face? So um, a lot of it needs to come from FIFA. FIFA, like actually like valuing the product that they have and 
selling the product well and marketing it well um you know there's so much that more that can be done like a lot of the good stuff that's happening around here is because of the australian bid and the australian and the australian new zealand bid um rather than uh you know fifa themselves mm. and even on infantino's answers today about about all of it like about the australian video um so australia have asked for for uh equal pay i think some of these things you have to break it down into like easy campaigns and and the equal pay thing is important and it would be really symbolic but i think what would be what would be better for the sport is you know the inputs going into it being more equal so if they spend x amount on the men's world cup the same amount should be spent on the women's world cup in a sustainable way to help bring football to more countries to help grow grassroots in the countries that it is taking off in Mm. maybe to help broadcasters in some of the countries who wouldn't be able to afford to show a lot of it on telly so maybe that they can show it in in more places um that the facility like this is the first world cup that every team gets their base that they get their own training base camp like yeah Imagine, like, like we were talking about Saipan in what two thousand and two, and this is the first year that women have got like their own base camps for for the World Cup. Yeah. So, you know, there's so far to go, and the reason you're hearing all these controversies, I think, is because the first time that women feel like they they can say it rather than just accepting the scraps that people are willing to give them. Yes, I dare say you're right. You both have beds to go for. It's very late. So uh, <laughs> just predictions times uh, to, to, to wrap up. It's interesting, you know, you, you cited the England lack of depth off the bench at this tournament. I mean, for Australia, Kathleen, we look at Sam Kerr and she kind of dominates. But then against France, Mary Fowler comes off the bench and scores no problem. And they have that kind of depth. So tomorrow is the toughest game of Ireland's group stage, we're saying, for various reasons. Uh, what well, We know what the hearts say. Your, your brutal head most realistic assessment? Uh, I've been predicting 3-1 for a couple of weeks now to Australia. I think that they just, as you say, they have the firepower. I think even you look beyond Sam Kerr, like players like Caitlin Ford, the stuff that she does with Arsenal week in, week out. She leapt into the place that was left behind by Vivian Miedema and Beth Mead this year and absolutely helped drag them through in the same way that... Katie McCabe did so that's the problem well, if you nullify Sam Kerr and you stick a couple of players on her what are you going to do with the rest of the team mm. so yeah I think 3-1 they definitely know where their goals are coming from a lot easier than we do yeah Sinead um, my really pessimistic look is taking Kathleen's 3-1 and going I'm not sure we're getting a goal <laughs> um, so and I've been worried about that probably for a couple of weeks that there is definitely a scenario where a, a goal goes in early and we do lose 3 nil. But I also think there's a plausible scenario that we do frustrate Australia for 60 minutes yeah. and then anything can happen. You know, we can nick one at the other end. Um, but those US performances you know. in the summer are kind of the template we're hoping for. Yeah, exactly. Like, And I think if, if they can get that, if they can settle in early and kind of set up in that defensive mode, but not in the like really batten down the hatches mode that they're playing so deep that something's eventually going to bounce in. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's I find it hard to predict between those kind of plausible scenarios. But yeah, I wouldn't. I think people should have expectations that there might be a heavy enough loss. I would love to keep it to something within two goals because I think that would help going into Canada and yeah. Nigeria. Um, I think that would probably be a, a, a decent result. I think over two goals would be frustrating. I think for the girls, but. Um, yeah, my other like fairy tale thing is just like a Katie McCabe screamer, but I don't think she's going to be able to play off the high enough for yeah. yeah. that to actually happen. Uh, but that's dream scenario. Yeah. Well, it's possible. A one-one would be lovely. Oh, well, <laughs> a one-one absolutely. would be just like yeah, dancing in the streets territory. Um, Sinead, people should read because I think Australia yeah. could go on. Uh, I think do Australia well. could go on and do it. I like. I would love like my actual dream scenario is like a Saudi Arabia kind of story, like that we beat. Uh, the team in the opening game but then they go on and have a run to the final because it would be great for the tournament for Australia to have a run to the final it really would yeah I can imagine people should read your piece on Sinead Farley if they haven't it's on the 42 Sinead thank you so much great to talk to you you. enjoy it out there Kathleen McNamee you've been on 438 podcasts so far you need to sleep (laughs) you need to you need to you got a big day tomorrow you need to chill out I know (laughs) Uh, thank you so much Um, no problem at all. I'm sure I'll be talking to you a lot over the next few days anyway. So Yes. Kathleen, <laughs> turn off this. your phone. You might sleep past three o'clock then. <laughs>
it doesn't uh even if i leave it for an hour i'm still just lying there staring at the ceiling so yeah i laugh my parents keep saying the only reason they know i'm alive is because every i keep popping up on the radio every so often and they're like oh she's fine yeah <laughs> um okay thank you both so much enjoy tomorrow what an amazing day and to be there for it is great so thanks guys see you later thanks joe Thanks. There we go. Sinead and Kathleen from Sydney. And the Women's World Cup show, I should say, and off the ball with Sure 72 hour non stop protection tested to the limits. Sure, it won't let you down. So they're very much on board as our sponsors for the next month or so.